One of the things that we tend to do very often is view Chinese motivations through the lens of our own motivations, through the things that we expect. And just to give you an example of that, um, when China went and bought a mountain, Toromocho in Peru, some people thought this was a kind of imperialist act, this was a land grab. The reality was, this was dictated by the need to try and get electricity to remote communities. It takes a lot of copper, and Mount Toromocho is made of copper. If I can give you another example of how we sometimes completely misunderstand the, the Chinese perspective, the, the, the way in which things in China are determined by inward pressures, not like external pressures. Um, I was in Beijing when, China was, when Beijing was bidding for the Olympics, and the um, evaluation commission arrived in February one year, and as they drove into town, all the grass was green. Well, as anybody who knows Beijing in February knows, it's multiple shades of sepia. Um, now, a lot of people thought that they were just trying to fool the foreigners. Of course they weren't. The municipality was trying to demonstrate to the national government, which is also based in Beijing, that in bidding for the Olympics, they had thought of everything. You have to find the internal perspective, because China's internal preoccupations are so great, they, do, they dominate the political thinking. If you fail the Chinese people, then you end up with a country that is unstable and in chaos. And that is not in our interests any more than it is in China's. The reality is that there probably isn't a consensus in favor of democracy at this stage in China, because there is a consensus, and a very strong consensus, against instability. Too many people have lived through such unstable times, and what they cherish is stability, and there's a high price that they're willing to pay for that. So for China, in some ways, democracy is a bit of a luxury that maybe they can't afford just yet, but that doesn't mean they don't aspire to it. China very soon will surpass America in spending on science. Now, should we welcome this kind of leadership? I want to conclude by turning the motion back on itself. China's always going to be too preoccupied by its own internal problems to pose any kind of external threat. But if we meet the rise of China with hostility, then China will be defensive and hostile. But if we welcome the re-emergence of a country with a hard-working and innovative people with high aspirations, we stand also to benefit from their energy. The Chinese people deserve an awful lot better than to have to apologize for their backwardness. And they've worked unbelievably hard to transform their nation. Let's not turn them into nationalists. Let's foster their instinct for cooperation. Essentially, this is the point. If we welcome China as a global superpower, China's rise is much more likely to be benign, and we are much more likely to be beneficiaries. No, we shouldn't be uncritically sycophantic. But opposition would spawn defensiveness, destructive hostility. So whether China is benign or a threat actually probably lies more in our hands than in theirs, which is why I would urge you to support this motion predecessor, I had to stop and realize that we're not talking about the same country that I visited almost 20 times. We talk here about corruption, and corruption, which the distinguished gentleman said, was endemic in China and how it's being fought. But there's only one slight problem. Xi Jinping, in recent studies, is only attacking his enemies, none of the people that support him, including, according to the New York Times, a mere fact that his hundred closest relatives of Xi Jinping are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And when Zhao Bao, the outgoing prime minister, according to the New York Times, was worth $2.7 billion. Corruption is endemic. Corruption is rife. The, the fight here is a political fight, not one against corruption out of this. But the reality is that China matches nearly every major characteristic for the rise of great powers over the last 500 years. But what people are missing is how much the Chinese believe that they have been repressed, they have been beaten, they have been humiliated, and the time has now come, and the communists are playing on this repeatedly with strong nationalism, how much it's now our time. You notice the previous speaker did not talk about the South China Sea or the East China Sea, didn't talk about all of the aggressive actions that the Chinese have been taking there, bringing in, taking over barren reefs that under international law do not belong to them, and are militarizing them. And therefore, the, the obvious question is, who's right? And what we need to do is to look at what other countries in the world are doing 
reacting to China. If we had the representatives of Vietnam and of India and of Taiwan here, all of them are spending billions of dollars more in order to prepare for an ultimate confrontation with China. The President of the United States, who is perhaps the most passive president that we have had in the post-war era since 1945, the one thing he's willing to spend money on is the reset to Asia, try to work some with the Chinese, but build up American assets and American capabilities for an inevitable clash. Do we want that clash? No, we don't. The powers that are growing in the world today are not the United States, which is in somewhat of decline. It is not the EU with its 1.5% economic growth rate, which is also having serious problems. The great triumphs in the world today, whether it is Russia and what we've seen in left bank Ukraine and Crimea and Abkhazia, or whether it is China with what they're doing in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, or it's Iran, which is leading battles for in places like Iraq and um, Lebanon and Syria, they are the rising powers today. And we can't shut our eyes and assume that we can just deal with them in a passive way. We have to make it clear to them that there are serious costs for what they are doing because we want a democratic world. We want the world we dreamed of in 1918. We want the world that we dreamed of together in 1945 and the world that we so passionately believed in in 1991. That is a world of democracy. That is a world of socially responsible capitalism. That is a world in which all the peoples of the world have the right to certain inalienable human rights. And that is what we believe in, but unfortunately, the other side does not. Thank you very much. And, uh, I, want, I, want to, uh, I want to say that in a sense, this motion um, is self-defeating because you know China is a superpower and we will be most unwise not to work constructively uh, with that uh, superpower. But uh, I, when I worked in, in government as a cabinet minister personally, found the Chinese much easier to deal with than the Americans. And I also found that they were increasingly taking uh, their role on the world stage seriously. If you look, for example, at what China has been doing uh, in Africa, where increasingly they've been supporting the United Nations. I think particularly of the hospital that is run by Chinese UN uh, soldiers and doctors in South Sudan, the work that has been done with Britain on building uh, roads in the uh, DRC. Uh, it, is, it is perfectly clear that, that China is beginning to embrace uh, this uh, world uh, role, and we should very much uh, welcome that. So and I, in terms of the contribution they're making internationally, I think we should respect and welcome and encourage China in that superpower role. And then if you look at what is happening in their own country, the quite extraordinary progress they have made in lifting hundreds of millions of their citizens out of uh, poverty, the universality of uh, schooling, the attack on hunger uh, so widely successful, the avoidance of an HIV uh, epidemic, the continued respect against expectations of what makes Hong Kong such a successful uh, society, announced and signed yesterday a major investor in the UK's nuclear power industry, which will keep uh, the lights on, thanks to the Chinese uh, provision uh, in some parts of that uh, ad adventure of uh, new winning technology. It is not so long ago that the British Parliament seriously considered locking people up without charge for 90 days, a measure that was uh, defeated by the Conservative Party. We are a country where 75% of our judges move from the cloisters of public school to the cloisters of Oxbridge to the cloisters of the inns of court without ever coming into contact with real life upon which they then pass judgment. Where only 15% of judges in this country are women. Where police allow a distinguished public servant to die not knowing, nor his family either, that vile and odious allegations of sex crimes are a myth because the police don't want to look as if they have uh, screwed up. A country which is seriously today contemplating withdrawing from the European Convention on Human Rights, which we set up after the Second World War. A country in which this weekend will finally recover one of its citizens locked up for 13 years without even being charged for any crime or offence from Guantanamo. A country which has uh, forgotten that human rights are for everyone, not just for 
nice middle-class people from the royal town of Sutton Coalfield and members of the Cambridge Union. So, in... So, in indulging, Mr. President, in a perfectly legitimate debate with China about the progression of human rights, let's, uh, let us maintain a sense of proportion and, ladies and gentlemen, welcome and respect China as it comes into its own. Thank you very much. Whilst we are asking the hypothetical scenario, what would China be like as the next global superpower, I would argue that if we look at what's happening in Africa, we already know the answer. China is, for all intents and purposes, the global superpower for the African continent. China is now Africa's largest trading partner, and by 2025, it will have financed $1.5 trillion worth of projects on the African continent. It's also the major extractor of Africa's natural resources. And those natural resources are crucial to China's growth because Africa has 10% of the world's oil, 40% of the world's gold, and 80% of the world's platinum and chromium mineral deposits, all crucial for fueling China's growth. So how would I describe China's role as a superpower on the African continent? Well, I would describe it as imperialist. I don't say that lightly because China has not had the same history as Europe or even Japan. And it's true that China has had opportunities in the past where it could have accumulated an overseas empire in the same way that European countries like Britain did. And it didn't do that. So in many ways, it's not the conventional empire that we might find familiar on the British Isles. But if you look at China's attitude towards resource extraction, the way that it has developed its power relationship with Africa, I would argue that this is a new model of imperialism, and one which I believe we should be extremely concerned about. The Chinese attitude towards Africans is a mirror of what is reported in the global media, and I would include culpability for the British media in this. But uh, Chinese, many Chinese people believe that Africans are simply inferior, that they're dirty, and they're disease-ridden, and that they are, have criminal intent which I agree is a reflection on the global and prejudiced, historically baggage-laden narrative towards people of other races, especially Africans. But this permeates all levels of Chinese society. In fact, I heard a story of a senior manager of a dam project in Botswana who confessed to a local journalist who I know that he refused to shake hands with local Africans because he was worried that he would contract HIV if he did. And in conclusion, I would say that China, as an imperialist nation, is doing more harm than good. Now, many people, and perhaps this is implicit in your argument, would argue that this is exactly what European imperialism did. And I agree, but the problem with this argument is that European imperialism was bad. I don't subscribe to the view that everybody gets their turn to plunder and pillage the earth in order to fuel industrial development. And so, on that note, I oppose the motion. Thank you. I'm conscious I am the uh, fifth uh, speaker at the dispatch box this evening, so I shall follow the very wise precedent of King Henry VIII, who apparently said to each of his six wives, please don't worry, I don't intend to keep you long. <laughs> I had a very difficult choice to make this evening. I actually was also invited to speak at the Oxford Union this very evening. Yes. <laughs> I thought it was a very difficult choice until I heard from my colleague how dangerous a place Oxford would have been. <laughs> now, I'm not an unqualified admirer of China. They've got a lot to satisfy because one of the consequences of being a global superpower is you have responsibilities, not just rights. And I think the jury is still out with regard to China in many respects. Economically, it has achieved a fantastic progress over the last uh, few years. We've all seen that happening, and all credit to them since the days of Deng Xiaoping. But they have created already an enormous nervousness amongst all their Asian colleagues. We see the conflict they have with Japan over some miserable little islands 
which could turn into an actual physical conflict. We could see the demands they have made and the weight they, their own weight that they've been throwing around with the Spratly Islands, which they demand as their own when four or five other countries in the region also have a claim. And when this side of the house asks you to welcome China as a global superpower, not the global superpower, but as a global superpower, we are firstly recognizing that that's what they're entitled to by virtue of their history, their size, their economic importance, and other characteristics of that kind. And secondly, it's a recognition of what they've already achieved in transforming what used to be one of the world's most backward countries. But it's thirdly, a recognition that unless China succeeds, both in its economic aspirations and, let's us hope, in transforming China into a pluralist, more democratic system that understands the rule of law, unless it does that, not only will the Chinese people suffer, but the world as a whole will be a much poorer and more dangerous place. And it's on that basis that we welcome China's first steps in the direction towards that ultimate objective. Thank you very much. China is a member of most international organizations. Its military spending is second to the United States. There is no case here to be made to marginalize China, and I do not intend to do so. But description is not enough. In fact, I will argue that the esteemed uh, proposition team mostly talks in descriptives. They're telling us that China is doing well, China has d done so much over the past 40, 50 years, which is all true, but that's not the point. The point is how the House, whether or not the House should welcome China as a global superpower. So for that, you get two, two. Um, for prescription-wise, <laughs> the second component, the second approach is prescriptive or normative. Is that what are our reservations in acknowledging China's soft and hard powers? What are the terms of fully accommodating China in the international society? And what, despite the value conflicts that you have rightly pointed out, in fact, oftentimes in your speech, I thought you were arguing on my behalf. Um, but there's a third uh, uh, aspect to this, and that's how I want to structure our debate today, my position, which is the strategic implication for the United Kingdom. So the house here is a proxy for United Kingdom. My focus, my argument is, what are we getting into with this diplomatic and economic policy pivot to China? How should the UK position itself in this global power shift, which you have rightly pointed out? No one here is denying that the world today is very different from 30 years ago, from 15 years ago, from 20, uh, no, 50. So what if this China dream for the UK is but a fantastic self-image of the UK at the heart of this new global network of exchange and influences via uh, the commercial diplomacy we're trying to propose here? You know, does it really help us wean off our deference to the United States or our history of Eurocentrism? Does it, in fact, disengage us from Winston Churchill's three interlocking circles of the empire, the transatlantic relationship, and what does it mean for us when we do that? Now, no. numbers tell us that UK is far less important to China than China is to the UK. This translates into weak leverage. Right, Chinese investment in UK has been less than 1% of GDP. Uh, similarly, UK investment in China is less than 1% of the total FDI in China compared to 3 to 6% by US, German, and Asian powers. Uh, if you look at Chinese FDI into the UK, it's nothing compared to, it's at least you know, one third, one fifth less than uh, US FDI uh, to uh, the UK. Um, it's, been in the news, it's been in the news that you know, we have our trade is now trade volume, bilateral trade volume is now at the height of 43 billion. No one probably told you that 30 billion of that is actually our import, uh, our uh, uh, Chinese uh, export to the UK, which means that we're running a major and seriously decline, uh, uh, worsening trade deficit against the Chinese. So what I've tried to present here is not that I'm denying the right of the Chinese and the reality of their superpower status. The question is that there are larger issues at stake that may be undermined or miscommunicated by UK welcoming China into this world.